My name is Ryan Cox, and uh, you are, you have teleported into week 16 of our series from uh, the Gospel of Luke called The Cradle to the Crown. And we're looking at the life of Jesus from start to finish because, uh, because frankly, I don't know what pastors talk about if they're not talking about Jesus. That's just me. I don't know where he came from, but uh, we, we, uh, we talk about Jesus here because he's the only hope we have, the only hope we need. Amen. So let's get rolling. I'm in uh, Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. We're going to see what the Word of God has for us. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd since he was a short man. A wee little man, as a song once told us. Have you heard that before? 9 a.m. thought that was funny too. I'm two for two on that joke. Verse four, so running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down because today I must stay at your house. Imagine Jesus saying that to you. So he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. All who saw it began to complain He's gone to lodge with a sinful man. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor, Lord, and if I have extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Today salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. This is God's word. If you were here with us last week, we looked at the story of the, uh, the rich young ruler. And the, the, real, the three big ideas that we kind of took away from that was, was, number one, that the cost of following Jesus is great. Number two, the cost of following Jesus is nothing compared to the cost of rejecting Jesus. And then thirdly and finally, that Jesus always gives us more than we give him. No one will ever be found to have outgiven God if we bank that he is, he lives, he exists, and he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. This story... Uh, at least on the surface, is similar to last week's story because at the core, what you have is a very rich man approaching and having some kind of interaction with Jesus. The most glaring difference, however, between this week's story and last week's is that uh, the rich young ruler walked away from Jesus sad, whereas Zacchaeus walked away from Jesus saved. And he's in heaven right now because of it, which is a pretty exciting thing to think about. Uh, but that, that makes me um, you know, want to compare and contrast the stories and see what was it about Zacchaeus' interaction with Jesus. What does a, a, a real encounter with Jesus entail since that's what this man had? So to do that, let me go through verses 1 through 3 again real quick and kind of give you the backdrop. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd since he was a short man. This brings me to my first idea today that a real encounter with Jesus will have real obstacles. This is the first thing that I noticed that is glaringly different between Zacchaeus and the rich young ruler because last week we just read that the rich young ruler just walked up to Jesus and started talking, whereas everything that you see in just the first three verses of this story is really highlighting all the obstacles that threaten to keep Zacchaeus from Jesus. And I'm convinced, you know, as I've been studying this week, that the reason the Bible records this for us is to, is to highlight the reality that oftentimes in life, I would say this is the rule rather than the exception, it's when when you and I start moving in the right direction that we'll be faced with resistance. Anybody experienced that before? When you're trying to get back to God, when you're trying to dig in, when you're trying to take your next step, that's when obstacles have a tendency to present themselves. And I think our enemy makes sure of that, to be, to be totally honest with you. And, and believe it or not, I find this idea encouraging for one reason, because there's a tendency, even if we know better, there's a tendency for us to feel like when obstacles present themselves in our life, when we're met with resistance or opposition or things get hard, there's always something in us that wants to say we must have done something wrong. 
that this must not be God's will, that maybe I zigged where I should have zagged, when biblically speaking, I think the exact opposite is the, tru- is the truth, because I can't think of a single person in the word of God that was not met with obstacles when they began walking the way that God called them to walk. Just thinking about this this week, I can't, I can't think of anybody's life that God used in scripture whose, whose path was not marked with obstacles and resistance as they began to really walk in obedience to God. I've heard it said before that rockets burn the vast majority of their fuel just getting off the ground and out of our atmosphere because it's in the initial stages of the launch. It's during liftoff that they're really met with the most resistance. And frankly, I think our lives are like that. I think that because I, you know, I see that in Zacchaeus. I see that in so many characters in the Bible, but it's really highlighted here. And so this begs the question, if a real encounter with Jesus will have real obstacles, what are they? And, and here's what I did this week. Here's what I've been making a habit of doing recently. I conducted my own private sociological experiment and my, my staff at this point knows that if I poke my head in their office with an obscure spiritual question, it's probably going to be what the sermon's about nine times out of ten. So I'll ask you what I asked them. And, and once again, uh, sanctuary rules apply for the love of God. Don't answer me out loud. <laughs> what do you think keeps people from meeting Jesus? Or from growing in God once they already have? What do you think of the main obstacles that keep people from that. I'll I'll even, you know, I'll ask you to get personal here. Historically, go, you know, take a self-inventory of your life. What historically has kept you from God? Has kept you from growing in God? Having a deeper encounter with God? Or maybe, maybe the question is, what's keeping you from that today? What I see in the story of Zacchaeus is three Three things that he was faced with that I think are incredibly common to, uh, to the human experience were made of the same stuff he was. And I think these three things are gener- general enough that really uh, every one of us is going to be able to say amen to this. You've either experienced this or you will soon. And I don't care where you're at on the spiritual spectrum. I mean, maybe you're here because... You know, somebody threatens you and you're not really sure what you think about Christianity and you're, you know, you're a little bit skeptical figuring out what you want to believe. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you've taken a break from God and you're coming back from God like I know some of us are doing. Maybe you've been a Christian for years. You've been in, you know, doing the thing for decades. Regardless of where you find yourself on the spiritual spectrum, I think these three obstacles are things that are common to all of us. So here they are. Here they are. Here's what I see in Zacchaeus' life. Number one, sin in your past. Number two, comfort in your present. Number three, people in your life. That's what I see here. And the first thing that Zacchaeus' story reminds us is an obstacle that's going to threaten to keep us from Jesus is sin in your past. And I say that because right at the beginning of the story, we're told, just like last week, we're not just told Zacchaeus was some guy, we're told that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. And when you understand what it really meant to be a chief tax collector, I think you'll understand what I mean when I say sin in your past can really derail you and keep you from an encounter with Jesus. Um, you, you have to remember in, in Zacchaeus' day, in Jesus' day, the Jewish people were not free. They, they were ruled by the Roman Empire. And one of the reasons that the Roman Empire was so successful in conquering people and extending its empire for as long as it did is because they had a, they had a practice of when they would conquer a group of people, they would then levy these un, unreal taxes on them. Nothing like, I mean, you know, some of us got hit hard in taxes and understand, but nothing like the Roman, Roman Empire did. It wasn't just a big chunk. It was the vast majority of your income that they would steal from you. And the, and the reason that they did that was to keep you economically dependent on them. So that even if you did want to rebel, I mean, weapons cost money and you really couldn't afford them. And the people that would collect the money uh, from the conquered people on behalf of the Roman Empire were these tax collectors. Now, you may be thinking, uh, if a tax collector came knocking on my door, I just wouldn't give them anything. You know, I'd, I'd send them packing. But it's for that reason exactly that tax collectors were backed by Roman soldiers. And because they were backed with, by Roman soldiers, they pretty much could do whatever they want without any fear of consequences, up to and including taking a whole lot more money than they should have. And it was common knowledge that because tax collectors could do that, that's exactly what they did. All right, back in Luke chapter 3, John the baptizer is baptizing people. He's kind of become a celebrity. People are coming out of the woodwork. And we're, we're specifically told in Luke 3 that tax collectors came to him. So they want to repent. They want to get their life right. They get dunked by John the Baptist, and then they ask him the question, what should we do now? You know, what are we supposed to do? And of all the pieces of advice John could have given him, he said, stop collecting more taxes than you're supposed to. Why do you think John told him that? 
because that's what they did. That's what tax collectors really got rich off of, just like Zacchaeus was rich. And the worst part of it was, I mean, really, the reason that they were so hated wasn't just because they took money uh, from, from people. It's because the tax collectors themselves were Jewish. Uh, I've heard people try to compare tax collectors in the Bible to IRS agents. No offense if, you know, God's brought any IRS agents to the house, but I'll tell you, no one has ever hated an IRS agent like people hated tax collectors in the Bible. Because for a guy like Zacchaeus, for the tax collectors, they were actually stealing money from their own brothers and their own sisters and their own friends and their own family, their own people. They were taking money from them in order to support the empire that was oppressing their people. I mean, you couldn't get, you know, more bottom of the barrel. These people were traitors. They turned on their own people to the point that tax collector, the term, became like a term of derision, like an insult you'd levy at people. And Jesus even proves this. In Matthew 18, Jesus was walking us through how we should handle sin between us and one of our Christian brothers and sisters. And Jesus said, hey, if somebody in the family of God sins against you, you know, go, go to them, talk about that, confront them, try to resolve that issue head on if they've offended you. If that doesn't work, take somebody with you. If that doesn't work, get a group of people involved. But Jesus said at the end of the day, if they simply refuse to hear it, if they simply refuse to make it right to restore the relationship, what Jesus says you should do is let them be like an unbeliever and a tax collector to you. Which obviously that context reveals that these people were, you know, they were cut off, they were hated, nobody talked to them, nobody ate with them. They were just, you know, they, were, they, they might as well have had leprosy. Now when you understand what, what it means that, that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, so he's basically the boss of the tax collectors, you know, that he's about as far from squeaky clean as you could get on the, on the spectrum, you, you, you start to get a picture of, of, of what I mean when I say that sin in his past was really the first obstacle that threatened to keep him from Jesus. And frankly, it's an obstacle that keeps a lot of us from Jesus. And the reason I say that sin in your past can be such an, such an obstacle is because we can have a tendency to get stuck there. And what so many of us have a habit of doing is we, we can allow our past to dictate our future. And here's why. Here's why. Because the enemy is, is, is great at this. I mean, the enemy in the Bible, our enemy is known as the accuser. That's his full-time job. And so that's what he does. And so a lot of times when we're right where Zacchaeus is and we're trying to take our next step in God and go deeper in our relationship with God, he'll be right there to remind us of our past, of how much of a failure we've been. You know, of how many times we've blown it. And he'll start getting in our ear and he'll tell us things like, listen, you're kidding yourself. You know, it's just a matter of time before you screw up again. You know, you somehow managed to get these people fooled, but you'll prove how much of a sinner you are sooner or later. God doesn't want to use somebody like you in his kingdom. You know, it's for people, you know, Christianity, a relationship with Jesus, that's for people that, you know, have way less red in their ledger than you, have way less mistakes in their past than you. God couldn't, you know, use you, let alone love you or anything like that. And, and believing that lie is really what paralyzes people. But paralyzes so many people and keeps them from taking their next step and either getting to Jesus in the first place or going deeper in their relationship with God. And if you think about it, it's actually, I guess to give them credit in a weird way, it's a pretty brilliant tactic of the enemy for one particular reason. There's nothing we can do about our past, right? I mean, there's nothing you and I can do about mistakes that we've made, failures that we've been guilty of. And so the enemy knows one of the primary ways to beat up a lot of us and keep us where we are instead of going forward in God and experiencing everything God has for us is to keep, keep us obsessing over a past that we can't even do anything about, that the gospel says we've actually already been forgiven of. But I got to believe that there's a lot of people that God's brought to the house of God today that are right there. And that's what's keeping you on the sidelines you know, that's what's keeping you hesitant to get involved. That's what's keeping you from, you know, really getting into a community beyond just the 90-minute um, Sunday morning gathering. That's what's, you know, keeping, keeping you from letting anybody into your life. You know, you kind of got everybody at arm's length or, or you know, you, you're not really letting anybody in. You're not really getting into anybody else's life because you've believed the lie that you're the only one who's done what you've done. You're the only one who struggled with whatever you've struggled with. You're the only one who's thought about or, or, you know, whatever, what you've thought about doing. Like, we're not all made of the same stuff and thinking the same thing. I mean, why do you think, I was asking the, the early service, why do you think the Bible goes out of its way with blistering detail to record the failures of the people that God used? You ever notice that? That's how I know the Bible is inspired by God. Because if I was one of the gospel writers writing the account of my own life, you wouldn't hear about any of the dumb stuff I did. 
Why do you think think we hear about Moses disobeying God out in the wilderness, deliberately disobeying him, which is what cost him entry to the promised land? Or read the story of Samson, and it's almost a comedy of how much this guy just completely screwed his own life up, but magically, God found a way to use him despite his failure. You know, why, why, why depict David as a man after God's own heart, but then also tell the tale of his failure with Bathsheba and the ugliness involved there and the adultery and the lies and the web of deception and the murder, you know, just filthy, filthy. I mean, it almost gets you angry reading about that. Why well, say that Solomon was such a wise man, but he was also dumb enough to have 700 concubines and 300 wives? That's not wisdom. We can be sure about that, Amen. Or or, or Peter, the guy that Jesus said he's going to build the church on, goes ham and cuts somebody's ear off like a lunatic. And then like 30 seconds later, he's denying even knowing the Jesus that he just fought for. And that's the guy that preached on the day of Pentecost. That's the guy that that Jesus gave the altar call that saw 3,000 people give their life to the Lord. Why? Why would the Bible show that to us? To show us that we're all made of the same stuff. The Bible says that no temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. You know what that means? You absolutely are a weirdo, but so is everybody else sitting in a seat this morning. We're all in this thing together. But what happens is is, is we get, you know, we allow our past to dictate our future. And, And what I see here is that what I love about this story is it doesn't have to. Because Zacchaeus was the kind of guy, as a collaborator with Rome, everybody was sure when the Messiah comes, he's going to run roughshod on our enemies. He's going to destroy the Roman Empire and everybody that's working with them. These people were sure that it was people like Zacchaeus that were going to get the wrath of God, but instead he gets the grace of God in this story. And what that shows is that no sin in our past, regardless of what we've believed about ourselves, what we've told ourselves, what other people have told us, what our enemy has told us, no sin in our past needs to keep us from a deeper relationship with Jesus in our future. Amen? That's the gospel. That's good news. Amen? Isn't that good news? Man, I love that. I love hearing that. But wait, there's more. There's more, church. Maybe, uh, maybe that obstacle isn't really where you're coming from because you have no sin in your past. I mean, which thank you for, for attending with us this morning. That means a lot to us. Uh, but maybe that's not where you're coming from. You know, maybe it's not sin in your past that's keeping you or has kept you from taking your next step. Maybe it's comfort in your present. That's the second thing that I see in Zacchaeus' life because the Bible tells us not just that he was a chief tax collector with all kinds of red in his ledger, but also that he was a rich man presently. And as a rich man, he's a very comfortable man. And for a lot of us, you know, for a lot of us, I think this can almost be more dangerous. And it's not necessarily, you know, shame and guilt and condemnation that we're carrying around. It's not so much sin holding us back. It's our comfort keeping us still. You ever been there? Have you ever looked back in your life and recognized really that's what's held you up more than anything else? I heard somebody say one time, could not agree with this anymore. They said people don't, they they don't like, what is the term? I got to get this right. They don't know what they like. They like what they know. Yep, that's what it is. People don't know what they like. They like what they know. In other words, they like what they're familiar with. They like what they're comfortable with. We don't like the fear of the unknown as people. We don't like, you know, God stretching us or challenging us or taking to places we've never been before or getting outside of ourselves. We like what's comfortable. I mean, we're almost wired that way by our culture. You can even see that in the Bible. When God delivered the nation, just wrap your mind around this, and know that you're made of the same stuff. When God delivered the nation of Israel from 400 some odd years of slavery in Egypt, where their children are being killed, where they're being forced into manual labor that's literally and figuratively breaking their backs. God delivers them after four centuries and some change of this. They got it into the desert and like every 30 minutes they're saying, we should go back. We had it really good back there. I mean, how crazy is that? But all that is, that's human nature at its finest. We like what we know. We like what's comfortable, what's familiar. The problem with that, the reason that's such an obstacle is because biblically speaking, you can either live life as God desires you to, or you can live comfortably, but you can't do both. You can't do both. Find me a story in the word of God where somebody really gave their life to the Lord and followed his call on their life, and what they got was just a life of comfort and ease and stillness. No, it's it's, it's not the way that it works. We're promised the opposite of that. That's why a couple of weeks ago, if you were here, Jesus said, he was talking about the cost of following him, the cost of discipleship. He said, if anybody wanted to follow him, they needed to take up their cross daily. That's a metaphor for crucifixion. 
which was the the most brutal form, the most painful form of execution in Jesus' day. Of all the metaphors, you imagine if Jesus had a a campaign manager, I don't think he would have approved that slogan for Jesus' ministry. You know, take up your cross, get ready to die every single day and vote Jesus 2018 or whatever it would have been. But that's Jesus explaining this is not for the faint of heart. It requires you to constantly die to yourself and your desires and your comfort and your stability and your security. And, and, you know, as I say this, as I'm talking about, you know, taking your next step in God and growing in God and having an encounter with Jesus, you know, maybe some of you know that, you know, God's kind of been working in your life a little bit. Maybe some of you already know what that means. You know, maybe for some of you, taking your next step in God means, you know, going from just a, a, you know, Sunday morning attendance to getting into a small group. And really letting people see into your life and then getting into other people's lives. Because when you look at, at, at really what the Bible commands Christians, there's about, there's, I think there's actually more than 100, we call them one another commands in the New Testament that are commands for every single believer. You know, things like love one another, forgive one another, outdo one another in showing honor to each other, bear one another's burdens. Reality is, you can't do that if you're disconnected from the family of God. And biblically speaking, one of the primary ways that God grows us and develops us in the, in the people he calls us to be is in community with other believers. That just can't happen at a single 90-minute service once a week. That's why we offer small groups. Maybe for some of you, that's where, you know, you, you, you realize you're disconnected. You realize you've kind of plateaued, and that's your next step. You know, for other people, we're, you know, we're a church that has a, a, a lot of history, and so therefore we have a lot of people who have been in the faith for a very long time. You know, some of you have probably forgotten more of the Bible than a lot of us ever hope to know. Maybe in your case, God's calling you to take your next step and instead of just attend a small group, he's calling you to open up your home and open up your life to other people and begin pouring into them. Because you know as well as I do, God's walked you through an incredible number of storms. God's walked you through all kinds of things. God's brought you by, through all kind of dry seasons and, and, and the wilderness. And the reason he's done that, the reason he ever does that, is so that we can then walk somebody else through it. Maybe you know that God's called you to do something like that. Maybe God's called you to just make the shift from being a consumer to a contributor, you know, and start serving either in or outside the church, you know, start doing like Jesus did and not coming here to be served, but to serve and give your life for other people. But maybe even in knowing that you've told yourself, you know, I'm, I'm just really busy right now. It's just not convenient right now. You know, the kids have a lot going on, you know, work's really hectic as though that's not going to be true in every stage of life. And, and maybe, you know, before God, if you can get honest with yourself, if you know in your heart of hearts what's really keeping you, it's not your schedule, because everybody, I mean, is anybody not busy? Of course we're all busy. It's not your schedule, it's not your kids, it's not any, it's your comfort is what's keeping you still. I think comfort's the most widely abused drug of choice in this country. And I'm speaking from personal experience there. Don't hear judgment, we're all in this together. But if it hurts me, i got to hurt you too, amen? It's the way we do things here. Uh, I find it interesting, speaking of comfort, I find it interesting that in this story, Jesus references Abraham when he says Zacchaeus is a child of Abraham because there's really no story in the Bible that more powerfully shows us what happens when we do away with our comfort. All right, and that, that's the story of Abraham. And pretty much everybody here, I would say, knows at least something about Abraham. You know, he's, his name is basically, you know, synonymous with faithfulness, Right? I mean, Abraham, I would say you can make a strong case that there's not another human being in the Bible that was used more powerfully by God than Abraham. I mean, the the, the whole Old Testament is really the story of the nation of Israel and their interaction with God. There is no nation of Israel if there's no Abraham. He's the father of the whole daggone thing. Um, I I mean, this, this is the man. He's the patriarch. You know, everybody, it's almost like a term of honor to say I'm a child of Abraham. That's why, you know, people prided themselves in saying that. What I've realized is wherever you're coming from, I think you'd agree with this, everybody wants what Abraham had. You know, to experience the promise of God, the power of God, the provision of God, the protection of God, to see God do something in our life. That significance, you know, that that feeling of being important, of having a legacy that lives beyond us. Does anybody not want to live that kind of life? Of course we want to know God like that. But what I think we, we, we sometimes fail to realize is what it cost Abraham to live a life like that. Because consider for a second what it would have been like to be Abraham. The Bible tells us he's 75 years old. So he, he's, he's, he's living in a place called Haran. He's rich. I mean, like, really rich. He's got camels. He's got servants. He's got servants who have camels. He's got camels who have servants. 
All right, this guy's got the life. The only thing left for him to do is eat, drink, be merry, and eventually stop breathing. You know, this is, the, this is the American dream, basically. That's the only thing left for him on the agenda. And then God comes and wrecks that whole thing for him and says, Abraham, go. First word out of God's mouth, go. Not even an introduction. Just go. And, and Hebrews tells us, this is so crazy to me, that Abraham didn't even really know where he was going when he started the journey. So here's where my mind goes to. Imagine all the conversations that the Bible doesn't record for us, but you know took place. Like imagine all the people who lived around Abraham and saw him packing up at 75 years old, uh, you know, coming up to him next to his loaded camels and saying, hey, uh, hey, Abe, uh, where are you going? And he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm leaving everything I've ever known at 75 years old. And then they ask him, you know what the next question is? Well, where are you going to go? And he just kind of, I don't know. We'll see at 75 years old. Like that's, that's incredible to me, incredible to me that this man would do this. But that's what God called him to do, to walk away from everything that was familiar, everything that he had known, everything that was comfortable. And what the story of Abraham shows me is that before God called, the first thing that Abraham had to lay down on an altar wasn't his son, it was his comfort. And he would have never seen God the way that he did. He would have never experienced God the way that he did. He would have never come to know God's power and provision and protection and all of that had he not been willing to lay that down. And here's why that's important. Because so many times in our lives, we, we expect the exact opposite thing to happen. We expect God to front load the reality of his presence in our life. We expect God to front load his blessing, to front load his promise in our life. And we tell ourselves, as soon as God shows up, then I'll start moving, like he hasn't already showed up. He showed up, church, right? We got a bloodstained cross and an empty tomb that says our God showed up for us. And, and when I look at the life of Abraham in Genesis 12, you can see it clear as day. God said, go, and then I'll bless you, and I'll make your name great. And I'll bless all nations of the earth through you. He didn't say, I'll bless all the nations through you and, and I'll come through for you and I'll make myself real to you and then you can start going. He said, go and believe that I'll meet you out there. Believe that I'll meet you if you believe that I'm better at taking care of you than you are. And so, you know, if this is where you're coming from, comfort in your present, if that's what, if you just realize, you know what, I am comfortable where I am, but I don't want to be here in 10 years and realize that I've wasted a decade. I don't want to be here at the end of my life and realize I've never really done anything for God. Let me just remind us of something that we already know that's a healthy thing to consider. We get one shot at this thing called life. One shot. It flies by. I mean, I was telling the early service, my son in a couple of weeks I don't know if I've ever mentioned him before in a sermon, <laughs> my, but my son in a couple weeks is going to be three years old, and I remember like it was yesterday. Some of you weren't even a part of the church then, but I remember putting, putting a picture of him when he was just a couple of breaths old in that goofy-looking hospital cap, looking like a six-pound gangster, laying on my, on my wife's chest, drawing his first breaths. I remember putting that up there. That feels like it was just a couple sermons ago. That was three years ago. I'm 30 years old now. I don't have that much time left, church. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be it for me. I mean, I don't, seven days from now, who knows? You might have a new pastor, who knows? But jokes aside, we get one shot at this. And would it not be incredible to stand before God at the end of your life and say, God, I never had the time to serve you, but I did it anyway. I found the time. It was never comfortable to serve you, but I loved you more than I loved my comfort. And I believe that you'd take care of me, that you were more satisfying if I gave my life to you than keeping it all for myself. I mean, is that not the point of life, to, to run this race with endurance? Because here, here's, what we, here's what we can be sure of. Nobody has stood before God at the end of their life and said, I wish I would have taken it easy. I wish I would have done me a little bit more. I wish I would have made myself more comfortable. I know this. I know this. If every saint that has gone before us could talk to us now, they would say, lay it, lay, lay it down there. Forget about all the things that you consider a priority in your life. Live for eternity. Know that you're going to stand before God. Live in such a way that doesn't make sense unless he's real. Because every sacrifice you make for God is going to be worth it. Amen? Man, I feel like I can end the sermon there too. But wait, there's more. Okay? Maybe neither one of them are where you're coming from. Maybe you have no sin in your past and you hate being comfortable. Which, you're lying. So we'll talk. We'll give a sermon on lying next week. But... 
There's another obstacle that this story shows us can really jam us up, and that is, thirdly, people in your life. Gets real quiet when we start talking about this. But this is, the, this is the final thing I see as an obstacle in Zacchaeus' life because this story tells, the word of God goes out of its way to tell us that he was a very short man, but he couldn't get to Jesus because of the crowd. Here's why that's interesting. Because, so, so people in, in Zacchaeus' culture, people in the Middle East today are not very tall. We're a taller culture than they are. Uh, and, and so, you know, 2,000 years ago, however, they were even shorter than they are now. You know, cultures tend to generally get taller. So when the Bible goes out of its way to tell us that Zacchaeus was a short man, realistically, we're probably talking about a guy that was less than five feet tall. Realistically. But here's why that's interesting to me, that the Bible tells us that he's short. Because what normally happens when there's a real wee little man in a crowd? Or I should say, what's supposed to happen? Here's what's supposed to happen. The benevolent, the benevolent tall people that God has blessed vertically let him through. Because it's not like Zacchaeus is going to get in anybody's way. He's a wee little man. But the people wouldn't do that. Why wouldn't they do that? We already know that. Because he's a tax collector. Because they hated him. Because he'd probably robbed blind most of the people in the crowd that day. So they don't want him to get to Jesus. Jesus came here for somebody else. Jesus didn't come here for people like Zacchaeus, they thought. And this highlights another powerful reality we should be aware of. Another obstacle in our life. And that's people in our life. And there, I mean, there's all kinds of ways we can allow people to become an obstacle in our life. I mean, for some of us, for some of us, um, hey, you know that you're in a relationship that you don't have any business in. You know, it could just be you're with somebody that you know, they're, they're, you know you're, you're pulling in one direction, they're pulling you in another. And you know, you kind of gave the thing a shot because you were lonely, you were bored, and you told yourself, I'm not going to get all in. Now it's a couple months, a couple years down the road, and you know, as sure as I'm standing here, that's what's keeping you from moving forward in God. You know, it could be an extramarital affair that's going on in your life that needs to end yesterday. You know, for, for, for other people, it's just, you know, people become an obstacle in our life because we allow their opinion to have too much weight in our life. And we find ourselves caring more about what other people think of us than what God thinks about us. You know, or, you know, like, like, like Zacchaeus here, um, they can be an obstacle in your life because when you decide, hey, I'm done living this kind of life, I'm, I'm done doing what I've been doing and getting handed what I've been handed, I'm going to get right with God, you know, they're right there to discourage you. They're right there to remind you of the mistakes that you've made, like you can't remember them, and then they, you know, they knock you down instead of trying to pick you up. But the, one, of the, one of the primary ways that people can become an obstacle in someone else's life is highlighted by this story. It's by turning other people off with their own self righteousness. When I conducted my little experiment this week and I was asking people what keeps people from growing in God, one of the people that I asked, I just appreciated how honest they were. As quickly as the question left my lips, I said, what, what, what do you think keeps people from growing in God? Without even thinking, they said, other Christians. And I thought, man, that is an honest answer. That's kind of a cynical answer, but unfortunately, I think it's a true answer. So let me, I'll just ask the question, how many people do you think have been turned away from church or turned away from God altogether because of the, of the self-righteousness of the people claiming to be his followers? You know what's sad? We'll never know because they're not here to tell us. But what do you, I mean, what do you really think people mean when they say I've been burned by the church? That's what they're talking about. What they're saying is that somebody or some group of people inside the family of God, which is supposed to be the one place on planet Earth where, where we can be honest about how far we miss the mark, it's because somebody in the church has, has really done to them what, 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 what the crowd tried to do to Zacchaeus. They made him feel judged. They made him feel ostracized. They made him feel like an outsider. They made him feel like their sins were somehow worse than everybody else's, and so they're gone. They disconnect. They never go on to be who God desires them to be. And ultimately, it's people that were an obstacle in their life. And so let me just speak to this from both sides of the coin. For, for the people who, 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 who claim to be followers of Jesus listening to this, know this. And let, let this sober you up. Jesus reserved his harshest words for people who tried to stand in the way of sinners coming to God. Go through the gospel accounts. And you will see that Jesus butted heads so much harder with Pharisees than he did prostitutes. I mean, the verbiage that he used, calling them hypocrites, calling them whitewashed tombs, Jesus was explicit. The sin that riled the Son of God up the most is actually the sin that we tend to overlook the most, and that's self-righteousness. 
And so, hey, if, if you're here today and you claim to be a follower of Jesus, uh, you know, before you say something stupid on Facebook about somebody else, before you nudge the person next to you and say, hey, I can't believe that that person's here because I saw that they did this or heard that they did that and they don't belong here, be real careful, be real careful that you don't look more like a Pharisee than Jesus to the people out there that need this the most, amen? And so, hey, so first, let's be honest, hey, shame on people who claim to be followers of Jesus, but do this. But, but secondly, secondly, you, you know, this might surprise some people, but let me look at this from the other side of the coin. We can say shame on people who claim to be followers of Jesus, but exhibit self-righteousness, but can we not also say shame on people who allow someone else to dictate their level of involvement in the kingdom of God? And, and what I mean by that is, I'll unpack that, a couple of months ago, I was meeting with a young couple who had a young family, and, and, and you know, they, they wanted to talk to me about what was going on, and so they decided to disconnect from the church because somebody offended them. Before I keep going, has anybody not been offended by someone in church yet? Two services and not a single hand went up, praise God. And if you did raise your hand, I would say it's coming. Okay, one thing we should be sure of is as long as God decides to fill the church with people, you're going to get offended by one of them. And if you were the only person in your church, pretty soon you'd offend yourself. Okay, that's just the reality of humanity. And so here's, as they're telling me this story, I'm thinking, okay, so because someone else offended you, here's what that means. You're not worshiping God with other believers, you're not hearing the gospel preached every seven days. And, and your kids aren't being plugged in and fed and, and ministered to and taught and instructed and cared for by our rock star team of Sunday school teachers. And they are a rock star team of teachers. Believe me, my son comes home and tells me stories from the Bible, coolest thing in the world. Let me just say this though, who were you hurting when you decide to do that? You're not hurting the people who offended you, you're hurting yourself. And imagine how inappropriate it would have been if reading this story, we read that Zacchaeus heard the rumblings of the crowd that day and he said, you know what? These followers of Jesus are a bunch of frauds. They don't love people. They're hypocritical. They're making me feel bad about myself. I'm done. I don't want anything to do with the whole thing. If, if that was the end of this story, then the conclusion we've arrived at is Zacchaeus, you've only hurt yourself. And so let me, let me just say, if this last one applies to you, if it's people that have stood or are standing in the way of your increasing levels of commitment to Jesus, why let another person own you like that? I mean, amen? Why let another person dictate your life that way? Because we're not gonna stand before other people at the end of our life. We're gonna stand before God, amen? So before I keep, before I keep moving to my, to my final point this morning, let me just ask Two questions. And if you're in one of our small groups, this would be a great thing to just discuss with other Christians. First off, what is your next step in God? You know, we're talking about Zacchaeus having this encounter. You know, what, what is your next encounter with God? What's he calling you to do next? I've already given you like some possible answers. Is it getting in a small group? Is it leading a small group? Is it serving in or outside the four walls? Whatever it is, whatever it is, what's your next step? And secondly, what's keeping you from taking it? Is it sin in your past? Is it comfort in your present? Or is it people in your life? Or is it, you know, one of the billions of things I didn't have the chance to talk about in a 30, 40 minute sermon? But whatever it is, what I love about this story is that it shows us that even though obstacles will present themselves, Obstacles don't have to keep us from growing in God. Praise God, our obstacles don't have to keep us from growing in God. Because what Zacchaeus does is shim sham on up a tree like a child, completely humbles himself. People would have been thinking he's crazy. And then Jesus walks by. And of all the people that Jesus calls out to, this is so like Jesus. Of all the people that Jesus calls out to in the crowd that day, it's the traitor. It's the thief. It's the guy that everybody else was sure, no, 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 no. Jesus didn't come for people like that. That's the person that Jesus stops, looks at, calls down and says, I got to meet with you today. I gotta meet with you today. And not only does it, this story show us that our obstacles don't have to keep us from Jesus, it shows us why it's so worth it to push through whatever is currently sitting between you and God. Because at the end of this story, verse eight, we read, but Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor, Lord, and if I've extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Today salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is a son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save the lost. This is my last point today. A real encounter with Jesus produces real change. This is what I love about 
God. This is what I love about this thing called the gospel. It always holds out for us the possibility that we don't have to be what we've been, and we don't even have to be who we are. And what I really love about this that I think is so misunderstood is that so many times we think that Jesus will save us when we step into eternity. Like we're just supposed to be miserable and lost in our sins here. That we're just going to be what we've always been here. But on the other side of eternity, we'll get a new name, a new identity, a new life, a new body. No, Jesus can offer us real change where we are. Here's why I like that. Because I'm tired of being me. Has anybody else ever been tired of being who you are? I love the idea of being more like Jesus and less like myself. And what this story shows us is that Jesus, here's why you can push through your obstacle. Jesus has gone further to meet you than he asks you in order to meet him. And he's right on the other side of whatever he's calling you to push through. So how does Jesus change us? We see three things here. First off, Jesus changes our lifestyle. You notice the first thing that Zacchaeus does is just start throwing money out the window like a lunatic. It's almost, it's almost comical to me. Out the gate, he says, Lord, I'm giving 50% of, of, of what I own away. And, and then on top of that, he says, whatever I've stolen from people, which let's be serious, he's done some stealing. He decides he's going to pay him back four times. Four times what he owed them. So whatever Zacchaeus had as far as a bank account, he basically just volunteered for the poverty line. The change in this man's life could not have been any more dramatic. Now, maybe you hear that and you think, if that's the kind of change Jesus is going to give me, I'm actually good on that. I'm not trying to volunteer for the poverty line. But don't miss why Zacchaeus did this. Because secondly, what we see is that Jesus changes our attitude. What's crazier to me than what Zacchaeus decided to do is that nobody told him to do it. There's no Bible verse that says you have to give away half of what you own to get saved or or repay back people four times what you stole in order to be made right with God. Not only did Zacchaeus do this of his own accord, he was happy to do it. He got down eagerly from that tree, joyfully from that tree and said, look, Jesus, look what I'm doing. Like he's excited to do it. And the only reason Zacchaeus could do that is because he finally found something that made him happier than the money that he built his life on prior to that point. He'd finally gotten a taste of this thing that really is amazing that we call grace. And we forget how amazing grace is. But when when Jesus says today salvation has come to this home, really what he's saying is this is what it looks like when somebody understands what God has done for them in Jesus. And what it always looks like is a life lived for other people. When, When you really begin to understand what grace is, how merciful God has been to you, what it means that Jesus takes our sin and gives us his righteousness, what that will always translate to as it becomes real in your life is you stop living for yourself because you realize, I don't have to live for myself. Jesus did that for me, and now I'm free to live for other people. That's that's what I mean when I say Jesus changes our attitude. But lastly, finally, Jesus changes our identity. Because all the way at the end of this story, Jesus says that Zacchaeus too is a son of Abraham, meaning Zacchaeus too is a part of the family of God, which is more, even more incredible to me when you consider that this guy was considered a traitor against his own people, that this guy could not have more sin in his past. And in a moment's notice, Jesus said, none of it means anything. None of it means anything. None of it's going to keep him from God any longer. Even Zacchaeus is welcomed into the family of God. And that's exactly the promise that you and I have in Jesus. And so, I don't, you know, I don't know what, what I finally see at the end of this story is that Jesus has so much more for us than we have for ourselves. We, we have this tendency to hold on to these small little lives and let our obstacles keep us there. I don't care what your obstacle is, is, is this morning. If it's sin in your past that's been keeping you where we are, know that Jesus died for every single one of those sins. He took every single one of those sins to the cross and then to the grave and he left them there when he rose again on the third day. And not only does he take your sin, he gives you his righteousness the moment that we gave our life to him. You know, if it's comfort in your present that's keeping you still, just just believe, just believe, even when you can't see, that Jesus has a more satisfying, more thrilling, more fulfilling life for you than you have for yourself. And if it's people in your life that have kept you from growing in God, know this, you're not gonna stand before people at the end of your life. You're gonna stand before the God that made you. And in Jesus, he has already declared us to be made righteous in his sight. Amen. So whatever the obstacle is, whatever it's going to take, just know that you could be right on the other side of an incredible encounter with Jesus because he's got a better life for you than the one he's calling you to let go of. All right, that's it.
That's all.